My name is Mutiat Olagoke, aka the Queen of Awesomeness, and you are watching Mustaina TV. Don't touch the dial. If you change it like this, your remote will blow. Don't touch it. Bye. <laughs> Mustaina. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Ya. الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فَمَن تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَّهُ وَأَن تَصُومُوا خَيْرٌ لَّكُمْ إِن كُنتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون مستعينا My people, my people, how on a day? Again, one TV, I won't tell you, and I am the same Starina TV, now the number one of Bongia Muslim channel worldwide. Worldwide? Wait, Arabs are actually watching me. Are you a Mushahidi in Al Kiro? Wa Mutabirin Al Aberor? Habihi Mustarina TV. La da dogat is zir, wa kun mutana sikan, ana Khadija bint Aba Yaumi. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يعده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who glorify him, we testify to his oneness, he is alone without any associate. We also testify that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. May the peace and blessing of Allah subhanahu 
continue to be on the soul of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his household, his companions, and may the peace and blessing of Allah Subhanahu continue to show on every one of us. Um, we would like to tell a story about a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The name of this companion is Abu Dahda. He is also referred to as Ibn Dahda. So sometimes he is referred to Abu Dahda, Ibn Dahda. He was one of the people of Medina. And um, as the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were men whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose to accompany the Prophet. And there were those who were sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there were those who preferred the hereafter to this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the dunya easy for them. Allah opened the world for them. But then they preferred the hereafter above the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَطْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيًّا يَرْجُونَ تِجَارَةً لَنْ تَبُورَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that there are people who read the, the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are people who read the book of Allah and they establish prayer and they spend out of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them Desiring from Allah tijarat al a transaction that will never fail, a transaction that will never go awry, a transaction that will always be profitable. This particular statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Fatir, verse 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a beautiful example of how people enter into beautiful transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, transaction that never failed. One of those who entered into a beautiful transaction was this Sahabi, this Sahabi um, Abu Dahda. It happened that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in the company of his companions one day and a young man, in another narration, they said a young orphan boy came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to complain about his neighbor. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him what uh, happened between him and his neighbor, he mentioned that he was trying to construct a fence around his garden. But when he got to a particular spot, he couldn't continue with the fence because there was a tree that belonged to his neighbor that was standing in the way. And he tried to speak to the neighbor. Maybe the neighbor would give him that palm tree, just a date palm tree. A date palm tree was standing in the course of the fence. And he begged the, the, the neighbor to give him the, the palm tree, the date palm tree, or even sell it to him. But the neighbor refused. So he came to report to the Prophet Maybe the Prophet ﷺ will intervene. So the Prophet ﷺ invited the companion, invited the neighbor. When the neighbor came, the Prophet ﷺ pleaded with him to allow the young man to continue his construction of a fence around his garden. But the man refused. He said, okay, if you are not going to give it to him, can you sell it to him? The man said, no, I'm not prepared to sell it to him. Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, okay, if you are not going to sell, why don't you give it to him? And for you will be a dead palm for you in Al-Jannah waiting for you. And the man insisted that no, he wasn't going to let the man have his way. Even after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intervened, he didn't let go. Then when Abu, among the companions who were sitting in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that day was Abu Dahda. 
He said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, if I buy this date, just single date palm tree, just one tree, if I buy it from him, will I have, will I also get the tree that you promised him that he rejected? Will I get it in Al Jannah? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Abdul Gani Baba today, a dig meeting, a manager with Lotus Capital Limited. How is Ramadan going? Alhamdulillah. Today, we want to talk about Islamic finance. What exactly is Islamic finance? There's Islamic and there's finance. But then, when you bring it together, you're talking about doing financing or making money or generating money in a halal way, according to the rules of the Sharia, according to the rules Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and I as Muslims. For Islamic finance to be um, complete, there must be equity, there must be fairness, there must be social justice, and everyone must be involved. So for example, any transaction I'm doing, I must ensure, how am I making money? Am I making money from haram, or am I making money from halal? Am I eating riba, or am I eating um, I'm taking profit according to what Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah that you can take, you can make money from trade, which is profit, but do not take riba, which is interest. The next question that may be on your mind is then what is interest? Interest is money on money and profit will be money you make from a transaction, a trade transaction, a buy and sell. However, in this trade transaction that you are doing, you must ensure that the two parties have an agreement. It is sacrosanct. There must, there must be an agreement. The two parties have an agreement. There is fairness. You are fair to both parties. There is no garar. That is, there is no uncertainty. There is no maysir. There is no gambling. There is no... Um, you need to be sure of what you want to do, where you want to make your money from. What are you buying? What are you selling? Who is buying? What is the exact nature of what you are buying? All this must be specified for Islamic finance contracts to be complete. And so, if you go back to the initial question when you say, what is Islamic finance? Basically, it's making money or generating money or doing business in a halal manner, following the rules of the Sharia, following what Allah has told us in the Quran. Don't take riba, which is interest, but you can make profit from transactions. So, what kind of transactions can you do? I said earlier that there mustn't be garar, that is uncertainty, meaning that you must know exactly what you want to buy, what you want to sell, the color, the nature, specifics. There shouldn't be maser, that is um, gambling. That is when some people will make at the expense of others. And that is why you have a lot of these um, betting games or betting um, outfits. They are not halal. They don't follow what the Quran and the Hadith says because some will make money and some will lose. Again, there shouldn't be interest. That is, there shouldn't be money on money. I said earlier that money on money is interest, but let's delve a bit into what is profit. So, for example, I want to buy a phone and the phone costs 10,000 Naira. So, I go to Mr. A that I need 10,000 Naira. Mr. A gives me 10,000 Naira with the notion that he's going to get 15,000 Naira in a month's time. Now, he's not concerned about the phone I want to buy. He's only concerned about what you get on his money. That transaction becomes haram because that is money on money. It is interest. But if you flip that transaction to make it profit, now I can make it a trade transaction. That is, I tell Mr. A, I want to buy a phone. So what I need is a phone, not the money. So Mr. A tells me, you need a phone? What kind of phone? Give me the specification. So thereby cutting out garar, cutting out uncertainty. What type of phone? What is the make? What is the color? What is the gigabyte? What is the RAM? And all of that, you know? So you go to the market with all this specification. You buy exactly what your, your creditor or the person that comes to you wants. So when you take it and you go back, there's a discussion. I have your phone. I bought it at 10,000 Naira, but I'm going to sell it to you because now this is a product and it is my product. So I'm going to sell to you at 15,000 Naira. So there's a, there's a um, what do you call it, negotiation. Oh, 15, 13, 14. At the end of the day, we have an agreement. Okay, we'll sell at 13,000. Mr. A and Mr. B, they both agree at 13,000. Then I give you the phone. You have what you need, which is the phone, and you can pay the 13,000 installmentally. So meaning that... In the next one month, you are paying 13,000. That 3,000 on the 10,000 is not halal for Mr. A because he has ended through a halal transaction and that is profit. 
This is where we'll stop today. May Allah make it easy for us and make our task easy. May Allah make us end the blessings of Ramadan. Till I come your way again. Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Mutiak Olaluki. Welcome to Musta'ina TV. Today, I'm going to be giving you tips on how to maximize productivity in and out of the house as women. Hi everyone, my name is Zina Baletupi Salam, the creative director of Articraft Cakes and More. You're welcome to our online baking course where you'll be learning to bake different types and flavors of cake. I believe you have the best learning experience as I will be showing you different tips and tricks to achieve the best cake science and art. See you in class. Welcome back. I'm going to be giving us nine tips on how to maximize our productivity in and out of the home as women. You do know that as Muslim women, we have key roles to play as wives, mothers, daughters, and members of the society. So, but imagine juggling all of this at the peak of productivity. We must admit that this is difficult because they do say that multitasking is a myth. However, it is possible. The women of old have done it and many of us are doing it too. So for those of us that are struggling for whatever reasons, here are nine tips you can apply to maximize your productivity. Number one, know yourself. Know yourself. What Mutiat can do well may not be easy for Shakira, but it doesn't mean that Shakira is less than Mutiat. It's just that we're different people. And maximizing productivity in all areas of our lives starts by understanding who we are and how we cope through these things. So you start by knowing yourself and understanding yourself. Self-awareness is key, but self-awareness is not just to know yourself, but how to apply the knowledge that you have of yourself in maximizing your productivity. So for instance, I would admit that I'm not the best when it comes to using my hands. Well, except I'm doing graphics or eating food. But for laundry and hard labor, I actually get paid easily. So what I have decided is rather than spending three hours to do something that someone who can use their hands properly well will do in an hour, I would rather my, uh, outsource it. So if you know that there are things you're struggling with, there's no need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. You could get training to improve on it, but if you find that it is just not in, your, in you to do it well, it's okay to outsource it. There's so many areas of our lives that we may need to outsource because no matter how hard we try, we may not improve on it. This is not to say that you should outsource everything. One of the things you must also know about yourself is what's important to you. Now, as women, we're juggling so many balls. Some of these balls are our glass balls. Now, for me, what's important and what's my glass ball it may be different from yours. For instance, family is key for me. I love family. Family is everything I was raised upon. So I am someone who will put everything down just to show up for my family, no matter where they are. For you, maybe you didn't grow up in a large family or have a large family or even have family at all. So family may not be a key ball for you. But of course, as Muslims, family is everybody's glass balls, right? But there's no all size fits all to this room, but you have, so you have to know what works for you, what's important to you, and that will make outsourcing and delegating and balancing all of this easy. So key point to remember, number one is to know yourself, know what's important to you, know the weaknesses that you cannot improve on that you may have to outsource, and then of course know your strengths too know your strengths too so, so that you can leverage on them to do other things well when you know what you're good at you know where to put your energy or even where to wing it and then when you know your weaknesses you will know what to do with them whether to improve them or to assess them and then there's also the element of limitations 
things beyond you that you, you cannot help but are affecting your productivity you also need to know those two when you find out what your limitations are it is easier to work around them so in order to improve your productivity know yourself your situation and your glass balls Mustaina. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله القائل في كتابه العزيز ولهن مثل الذي عليهن بالمعروف وللرجال عليهن درجة والله عزيز حكيم On this note I welcome you to Al Mustaina TV where we'll be talking about marital issues and uh, of course like we all know last year we discussed about choosing your spouse from the kitab and the sunnah from the quran and sunnah this year we shall be going a step further where we will be looking at yet another aspect of marital life and that is rights and duties of the husbands and wives i welcome you once again to this segment i am imam imran rufai today we shall be talking about this topic from the angle of its necessity the moment a family is built, the moment a home is built, then certain things will come up. One of them is responsibilities and one of them is the rights. These rights we are talking about are reciprocative in nature. You do yours, I do mine. Your right is my responsibility. My responsibility is a right. As a result of that, we shall be looking into the rights of the husband and the rights of the wives. And simultaneously, we'll be looking at the responsibilities of the husband, at the same time, the responsibilities of the wife. Looking at that, certain issues will crop up from these attempts we're going to be making. We shall be looking at who is the leader in the home, who leads the home. It's a natural question that will emanate. Whenever or wherever we have one, two, three persons living together, staying together, on a mission together, it's natural to select or choose one of us as a leader who will you know, paddle the canoe or will captain the ship. As the case may be we as muslims we have this nature in us and we have this training in us but it becomes a reminder for those who are just coming up perhaps sometimes we forget them and perhaps sometimes we don't even get to know of them the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in hadith said and this narrated by abdullah bin umar radiallahu anhu he said sami'tu rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wasallam yaqul I heard the messenger of Allah says, Kullukum ra'a, every one of you is a shepherd. Wa kullukum mas'oolun ar-ra'iyyati, and each of you will be asked about what he has shepherd. Fal imam ra'in wa huwa mas'oolun ar-ra'iyyati, the imam is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. Wa rajulu fi ahlihi ra'in, a man in his home is the shepherd. وَهُوَ مَسْعُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِ And he will be asked, he will be responsible for his flock. وَالْمَرْأَةُ فِي بَيْتِ زَوْجِهَا And the woman in the house of her husband, رَعِيَّتٌ is also a shepherd. وَهِيَ مَسْعُولَةٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهَا She is responsible for her flock. وَالْخَادِمُ فِي مَالِ سَيِّدِهِ The servant with respect to the services or the wealth of her master or his master, Ra'in is also a shepherd. And he will be asked about the responsibility given to him or her. On this note, it is very glaring that the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned the responsibilities in the Um and the duties expected of each uh, person in the Um as something that is very germane and that Allah Ta'ala will ask 
each of them. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَنَسْأَلَنَّ الَّذِينَ أُرْسِلُوا إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَنَسْأَلَنَّ الْمُرْسَلِينَ This is the principle guiding our activities as Muslims in our home. Let me quickly remind you, when a home is being established, certain pillars must be erected for a home to be a happy home. Don't forget in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Arba'un min sa'adatin nas. Four things are germane to the happiness of a person. When he mentioned them, it was not elusive of the fact that the home is equally going to play a germane role in the happiness of man when he said, Baytun wa si'un, a spacious home. Sometimes it's, a home might be spacious, but the troubles in the home can make the home confined. It can make it confining, and the first people living in it, it will be as if they live in a one-room apartment. Yet, it's a mansion with many rooms and many spaces. On that note, Islam establishes that the home must be built on two major pillars. Number one is called Ususul Bina. Ususul Bina, the foundation of the structure. And the second one that holds the Muslim home is called Subulu tahsin the pathway to fortressing the home by that we mean their principles on which the home is built on then their methods of fortifying the continuity of the home this topic we shall be discussing this year will uh, definitely touch into the, these areas and this line i've talked about i'll be back very soon inshallah may allah Accept it as an act of ibadah from us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.